Hey there folks, hope you're doing well. Uh, I am experimenting with some new uh, recording software here, so let's see how it goes. Um, gonna do my best to give you a lecture here. It's gonna be much shorter than usual. I, I think this one's gonna probably be under 20 minutes. We're just gonna cover some bare bones essentials here. Um, it's kind of, kind of awkward. I'm, I'm feeling kind of awkward about this. The, you know, uh, recording a lecture in my apartment alone has a totally different vibe than uh, giving a lecture in front of a classroom. You know, I feel kind of crazy. I'm talking to myself a little bit here. But that's okay. Uh, we're all learning new skills, learning uh, how to cope with this situation. So let's, uh, let's get her started here. So um, this week we were reading... Uh, work by Simone de Beauvoir. This is from a book called The Ethics of Ambiguity, which is really one of my favorite books of all time. Um, chapter 2, called Personal Freedom and Others. Uh, you probably noticed reading this, um, unlike most of the other people that we've been reading so far this semester, probably with the exception of Martin Luther King, uh, de Beauvoir is actually a good writer. <laughs> You know, she's actually kind of pleasant to read, or at least, you know, that's that was my experience. You know, expresses things well with a kind of poetic turn of phrase and isn't uh, entirely, you know, um, obscure in her terminology. Um, but Simone de Beauvoir was uh, pretty cool. Um, she is a French philosopher. Uh, she wrote about existentialism, phenomenology, and uh, her book, uh, The Second Sex, is, is a, a major contribution to the area of feminist theory. Um, deeply influenced by Heidegger, as were most of her contemporaries. Um, and she was actually married to one of her contemporaries, a, a philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre, who was another famous existentialist at the time. I think Simone de Beauvoir is kind of a better writer, but, you know, he gets more play. I wonder why that is. important to remember that uh, this book comes out really just in the height of um, Nazi occupation in Paris. And that informs quite a lot of um, how de Beauvoir is, is thinking about these questions of, of existential freedom and its relationship with ethical responsibility, right? Um, and in fact, you'll see this pretty clearly. It's it's kind of the uh, the theme or or the motif of this work that well, the problem with all these different figures of bad faith is is not just that you know they're jerks um, or that they're unethical in, in some abstract sense, but really that um, they like these figures of bad faith have have a tendency to sort of. Um, capitulate with with tyranny right they have a tendency to um end up on the wrong side of justice so the issues that she's thinking about here are um you know seemingly abstract but they're they're really drawn out of her experience with like well uh, who at the time in france um didn't join the resistance, right? Who who actually um, went along with uh, Nazi occupation, right? It focuses on this issue of what she calls bad faith. Bad faith is um, a central concept for understanding what's going on in this chapter. Um, bad faith. Bad, so bad faith. It, she's not saying that it's bad to have faith, right? Rather, what she's saying is that bad faith, um, what describes the things that we rely on and the sort of like network of strategies that we have in our everyday life that allow us to um, avoid direct confrontation with the fact that we have existential freedom, right? There are these things that we put faith in that um, allow us to defer responsibility for our own actions, right? Um, to, to deny that um, we... <laughs> did the things that we did right well you know the bad faith um allows us to say right well uh it wasn't me right i, I had no choice or whatever or or um you know uh it's not my fault for for these various reasons and it's a way of um 
justifying our behavior such that we sort of uh, don't take responsibility for these actions. And it's a way, as she puts it, of fleeing from our existential freedom. And you might think, okay, come on, Simone. Like, oh, why, what do you mean running away from freedom, right? Like, I mean, freedom's great, right? Everybody wants freedom. Uh, people have given their lives fighting for freedom. Uh, we tend to think freedom is, is better than not freedom. More freedom is better than less freedom. Um, it's, it's one of those things that we, you know, people are frustrated when they don't have freedom. So why would we, um, why, why would we invent a whole network of strategies to um, disavow the fact that we have it? Well, fine point. Um, existential freedom is, is different from, I mean, usually when we talk about freedom, we're talking about political freedom, right? Whereas existential freedom is, is something that you have even in a jail cell, right? I mean, even if they throw you in a jail cell, um, you still have free will, right? You still have existential freedom, even if you don't have freedom in the political sense, of course. Existential freedom is um, often described as, as radical freedom. And not radical in the sense of, like, again, not radical in the sense of, like, politically radical or, like, extremist. Um, more like radical in the sense of, like, radius. Like, in, in the geometric sense, where a radius of a circle um, constitutes the perimeter from the center, right? Radical freedom proceeds from the root, as they say. Um... It's radical insofar as when it comes to existential freedom, you alone are the source of your actions, which is what makes them radical. Um, so maybe it's becoming a little bit clearer why uh, we might have a tendency to run away from that. Because, uh, you know, not to come too close to quoting Spider-Man here, right? But uh, radical freedom entails radical responsibility, right? If you alone are the source of your actions, um, then there's no other, there's no further point to which we can defer our responsibility for the things that we do, right? Radical freedom also entails radical responsibility insofar as um, you, you are the source of your actions, Right? So bad faith doesn't involve fleeing from freedom as much as um, it deals with the, uh, fleeing from the consequence of freedom, right? Um, the consequences of having a free will and the responsibility that comes with this freedom, right? So if we're the sole source of our actions, then there's no other thing that we can pass the buck to when it comes to ethical responsibility. So maybe this is a little difficult to explain the abstract. I mean, um, there have been times when you've sort of felt the imminence of this existential freedom. The French have this uh, beautiful phrase. Um, I don't know how, I'm not going to try to say it in French, but you can see it on the PowerPoint. It translates to uh, the call of the void. Um, how to explain this? Right, so... I, you ever think about how easy it is? How many moments, how many hundreds of opportunities every day you have to just do something that would ruin your life, right? Uh, you know, this is that, um, the feeling where, you know, you see the big red button that says don't touch. You want to touch it, right? <laughs> or, um, or have you ever been sort of standing at the edge of a cliff um, or high up on a building and uh, looked down and, and had this sudden, almost invasive thought, like, no, I could jump off this. And then you sort of get scared of yourself, right? You sort of um, uh, get scared of your own freedom, right? Sometimes you get these um, this thought that you could just so easily do um, something terrible or destructive or embarrassing, um, and it makes you aware of your freedom. It makes you aware of the fact that like you could, you could do it. But you won't, right? I mean, I get this feeling all the time. So I, it's it's usually, well, sorry, not all the time. But, you know, it sneaks up on you. 
I think usually in like job interviews, have you ever had that feeling where, you know, uh, you're in a really stressful job interview and um, you think to yourself, yeah, look, I could just I could just uh, lean across the desk and, and grab this interviewer's nose and go boop, and then like it would be over, right? <laughs> like I could just it would be so easy to lose this job right now, um, you know. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's kind of terrifying, but it still sort of speaks to the um, the openness of the possibilities that our freedom has in, in those moments where you kind of confront that and and uh it's scary when it happens right I because mean, existential freedom um really in some sense is a burden right um I, you know to uh as sartre would put it um existential freedom is uh the kind of freedom that we find ourselves condemned to right as part of human nature that has free will um it's the kind of freedom that we couldn't bring ourselves to want but we are nevertheless stuck with right it's the freedom that's at the core of anxiety right remember when heidegger says that anxiety is a sort of disclosing um mood of dasein because it reveals dasein's freedom right um this is the freedom that through bad faith we spend quite a lot of our lives um running away from <laughs> trying to pretend that we don't have right um so, you know, bad faith is not a uh, rare concept. I mean, it's sort of something that we all live in to some extent. When, when Beauvoir talks about bad faith, it doesn't, um, you know, the contrast to that is not uh, good faith, right? <laughs> it's just um, a way in which we ought to be aware of... Uh, the discussion of bad faith is supposed to reveal to us um, when we're doing this, because it, you know, it, it is important, um, especially when it comes to thinking about ethical action, right? And of course, you know, this is a very negative uh, understanding of freedom, or it can be, right? I mean, uh, keep in mind that uh, Beauvoir also understands that freedom can be um, a joyous thing, uh, but it is also, you know, there's a scary aspect to it, right? Um, Especially um, to the extent that uh, existential freedom always implies this kind of unmitigated responsibility. So we can take a look at the opening lines of um, chapter two, which are really nicely written. Um, Beauvoir writes, man's unhappiness, according to Descartes, uh, is due to his having first been a child. Indeed, the unfortunate choices which most men make can only be explained by the fact that they have taken place on the basis of childhood. The child's situation is characterized by his finding himself cast into a universe which he has not helped to establish, which has been fashioned without him, and which appears to him as an absolute to which he can only submit. In the child's eyes, human inventions, words, customs, and values are given facts, as inevitable as the sky and trees. So that's kind of a big claim there. I mean, uh, she's saying that, um, she's sending this up uh, on the condition of childhood here. So let's, uh, let's pick apart this quote a little bit, figure out what she means. Child's situation is characterized by finding himself cast into a universe. I mean, this is um, very similar to Heidegger's notion of thrownness, right? The sort of unchosen element of being, right? Uh, children are thrown into a world already in motion, right? The world doesn't wait for you to catch up. You, you have to... Um, kids spend most of their early lives just trying to figure out uh, what's going on, right? You know, you figure out how your hands work and then next thing you know you gotta figure out how words work and then you gotta learn multiplication and also you know sharing your toys uh you know what are the rules to this world that they've suddenly found themselves thrown into um that is to say that the the child doesn't yet participate in the world they're just trying to catch up and, and figure out what is already going on around them so when we say that um the world appears to the child as an absolute to which 
they can only submit. Um, we mean that sort of the world full of these uh, social practices, values, customs, and forms of life, so on and so forth, right? All these cultural uh, things and social expectations. Um, the child doesn't yet have any authority over these things, right? They're just sort of there. They're just sort of out there, right? Waiting for them to find. Um, so they seem to exist, uh, you know, values and, and rules and, and customs. They seem to exist as if they were sort of concrete, natural objects, right? Um, as before it puts it, right? It's sort of as inevitable as the sky and tree. Just sort of they... they um, are there out them to find sort of like pre-given and um, inevitable facts, right? Uh, human values for the child are, are confronted as um, just unquestioned facts that exist with the same matter-of-factness as the sky and trees, right? Um, And they're just supposed to learn how to um, roll with the punches, right? They, they don't... Um, I mean, as she puts it, uh, the child doesn't yet engage in ethical action. Right? Not in the total sense of ethical action. They're just engaging in a kind of obedience, right? Where, um, I mean, a child doesn't introspect to find out whether what they're doing is good or bad. Right? They wait for somebody to tell them. Um, they don't know what good and bad are yet. They're still trying to figure it out. And they, they look to other people like, well, you know, um, am, am I being a good boy? Am I being a good girl? Or or the opposite, right? Um, these sort of, uh, even these, these value ascriptions about who I am or, or my own behavior uh, come to me from without, right? As she puts it, um, the child lives in a serious world. And keep in mind, uh, she's going to be using serious in a very specific way. Because um, this claim doesn't seem to make sense at all. It's like, well, no, adults live in a serious world. Like, kids clearly don't. I mean, kids aren't serious. Like, right? they run around and they sing Baby Shark. They don't have a serious life yet. They play around in the mud and stuff. Um,. That's true, right? Um, children aren't serious. They live in a serious world, right? Which is to say that um, for them and, and the way that they're negotiating the thrownness of this world and the way that they are filled with... Uh, their world is filled with um, these adults, caregivers, people who are telling them uh, what to do, what not to do. Um, you know... Their world is, is seemingly full of these just sort of concrete, immutable rules that they have no control over. Uh, they, they don't have to understand the rules, right? They just have to follow them. They don't have to endorse the rules. They just have to follow them, right? They don't establish rules, certainly. Um, their choice is just to follow or not follow these uh, static rules, which just sort of exist outside of them, right? Whether they follow the rules or not um, also has very little consequence, right? As Beauvoir puts it, um, their actions do not yet weigh upon the world. That is to say, um, you know, they, they have freedom in this sort of concrete world set up for them by others, but they have very little responsibility associated with that freedom because they don't um, really have ethical freedom in, in the full-blooded sense yet, right? They just follow the rules. They're not yet responsible for establishing or endorsing them. That's what we mean when we say that the child lives in a serious world. Their actions take place against a background of a world of serious rules, which allows the child themselves to not be serious, right? Because being serious is, is somebody else's job. So uh, when we say when we talk about the serious world, you know, we um, mean that the rules are they exist sort of independent of the child, right? Um, and also, you know, their their futures and their possible identities are also sort of given out there, sort of like statues um, that they aspire to. 
as Bouvoir puts it, right? Um, most kids want to be doctors or firefighters. You know, we ask kids, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they have a basic sort of role decks of answers. And it usually has to do with, like, well, who do they see, right? They, they see, uh, they go to the doctor, you know, they see the big fire trucks roll by, they ask questions about that, they have teachers. Um, right, their, their scope of, of existential possibility for uh, what they can be in the future is usually constituted by um, just what they've been exposed to, right? They just sort of conceive of these as um, not choices that they have to make, but sort of pre-given options, right? Uh, right, this is why kids always think that, um, you know, garbage truck guys are the coolest, right? Because that's somebody's job that they see. And, you know, you see somebody riding on the back of a garbage truck like that. That does look pretty cool. So I took a picture of this uh, kid over here who um, is meeting his heroes, the garbage truck guys. I don't know. Yeah, garbage truck guys are cool. Like, he's not wrong about that. Um, but, you know, as children get older, they start to see these cracks in the um, what was sort of uh, a solid or, or sort of unfrayed fabric of the adult world, right? At some point in adolescence, you start to understand, um, oh, right, uh, like, adults are humans, too. Uh, this adult world of rules and customs and values um, is set up by adults who are fallible, right? This is, um, these are human situations, right? It's not a natural situation. Um... And that can be exciting at first, but, uh, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're sort of cast into the adult world completely unmoored. And, and, um, and Beauvoir thinks that bad faith is when we, in various ways, sort of seek to return to the childish world, right? We seek to... Um, you know, recreate um, the world of the child where, you know, we, we don't have to take responsibility for our actions. We don't have to take responsibilities for the values we endorse. We don't have to take responsibility for um, our freedom, right? Uh, bad faith seeks in vain to return to this childish world um, where there are concrete rules and values and choices where you get to say, Things like, well, you know, it's not, it's not my choice. Like that's just the rules. Um, as she puts it, it's it's a way in which adults who are no longer children um, seek to avoid making authentic, um, existential, ethical choices. Right. Because as she put it, as she puts it, um, moral choice is aimed at an uncertain future. Right. Uh, that is to say, we don't know with certainty what the consequences of our actions are going to be. Um, and yet we have to choose anyway, right? Um, free moral choice always has to cope with the element of, of having to choose against the background of an, un of, um, an ambiguous future. Um, and even though we act against the background of an ambiguous future, uh, we still have to bear completely existential responsibility for those actions that we choose. Um, which is why we defer in so many cases to this notion of bad faith. Um, to try to erase or cover over the fact that um, we make moral choices uh, on the basis of radical freedom and have to cope with the ambiguity of the world, right? So that kind of sets up um, the basic features of existential freedom, responsibility, and, and the sort of way that she starts from the background of childhood in order to understand this concept of bad faith. And... Um, of course, bad faith isn't just one thing. Uh, Beauvoir lists, um, throughout the course of this chapter, she moves through 
uh, a bunch of different figures of bad faith, right? Um, so, you know, there, there's, uh, there, you know, being in bad faith isn't just one thing. There are a bunch of different ways to do it, right? And as you can see, there are all the um, figures of bad faith, and we'll be going over those in our lecture on Thursday. But um, the sort of main uh, moral failings, the primary sort of ethical failures uh, that all of these different figures of bad faith share um, are either one or both of the following. These figures of bad faith either try to um, cover over or conceal the fact that they have existential freedom and are therefore responsible for the things that they do, or uh, they forget the fact that their freedom is supported by the freedom of others. And that point gets a little bit more complicated. But we will, um, yeah, I don't know, cross that bridge when we get there, because uh, that's our Thursday lecture. Um, and that's as far as I want to take y'all today. I think that was a little longer than I said it was going to be. If so, I'm sorry. I um, hope it wasn't too bad. Uh, probably a little cringy. I'm going to probably listen to this and, and, and want to re-record it, but... I don't know. I will figure it out. <laughs> okay. I hope you all are uh, staying safe, staying healthy. Uh, yeah. Don't touch your face. <laughs>